right, I'm remembering to share my screen today, so we're off to a much better start. I may have to let you guys see it though. Let's see if it's because I don't have it plugged in. All right, uh, today we are going to be talking about PN junctions in great depth. We are going to start by talking about unbiased PN junctions. Okay. So let's consider what would happen if we had two chunks of semiconductor crystal and we were able to fuse them together here at x is equal to zero with what I'm going to call a metallurgical or step junction. And so what that means <clears throat> is effectively, I have these two chunks of semiconductor and I have fused them together abruptly at this one place. Um, so how many of you have ever heard of a, when you're in space, a concept called cold welding? Anybody? What does it mean? David, do you remember? Yeah. So in space under a vacuum, whenever you have two pieces of metal, of the same makeup and you touch them together, they fuse together instantaneously. Doesn't require any extra energy or anything like that. It's because they're under a vacuum. So you can literally weld in space at, at no temperature. Um, so on the left-hand side of this junction, let's make it the P side. So from here to here, is our neutral P region. Because it is a P type region, um, there are going to be acceptor atoms interspersed throughout the silicon, right? So the acceptor atom, we are going to think of it as being comprised of a negatively charged ion of boron or something like that. And it's going to have an associated hole, which is a positive charge carrier, such that overall the charge is neutral, right? So just for the sake of argument, uh, let's do them in blue. I'm gonna have a lot of negatively charged ions like so. And then associated with them are going to be, each one gets a hole that goes along with it. That's the whole point of acceptor atoms. They each donate a hole to the system. 
On the right hand side of our metallurgical junction, this is going to be my neutral N region. Make that smaller. Let's see, chat. How do you want us to take attendance for the online students? Um, so I should be able to get a list of the people that are in Zoom. But actually, uh, type in chat right now if you're online and you're on Zoom so that I can look at the group chat thing when it compiles the video and tells me who all is here. So if you're in Zoom and paying attention, literally just type anything into the chat right now. Potato, thank you, Ivan. Anything, thank you, Thomas. All right, I think that's pretty much everybody. Great. Um, so in our neutral N region, this is where our donor atoms are gonna be. So they are gonna be positively charged ions. And each one of these positively charged ions is going to have an associated free electron. And I am intentionally drawing significantly more donor ions than I did acceptor ions. And so we have electrons associated with each and every one of these guys. So if we looked at this system in terms of carrier concentrations, we would have something like this. So on the, and I'm gonna draw a line here representing this is the, so this is X is zero. Here's my line here. So the left-hand line is the edge of the crystal on the P side and the right-hand line is the edge of the crystal on the N side. I should see that my P region has a pretty large concentration of holes. I'm gonna call this P, P naught, okay? So it is the hole concentration, which is what that first P is for, on the P side of the junction, which is what the subscript P is for, and the zero is telling us that we are at an unbiased condition. So this is at equilibrium or what we're considering equilibrium right now. And I should see that on the end side, I also have a whole concentration and it's going to be very low. And so this will be P N naught. Just for argument's sake, so that we're clear about what these numbers represent. On the P side of the crystal, obviously that is the side that's very heavily doped with acceptor atoms. Um, so we should see that PP naught is approximately equal to Na, and PN naught is then going to be approximately equal to Ni squared over Nd. I've been using capital letters, so I'm gonna continue doing that. We have electron concentrations. Like so. So this is the electron concentration on the P side at equilibrium. So that's why it's NP naught. This will be Ni squared over Na. And then this is represents our electron concentration on the end side of the crystal at equilibrium and it's going to have approximately ND. 
So we have a concentration gradient, right? And what I mean by that is at our junction itself, at x is equal to zero, there is a discontinuity, um, and not even a discontinuity, I mean, there, there is because of the way we're looking at this, but there is an abrupt change in the concentration levels of our electrons as we move from the left side of the crystal to the right, and there is an abrupt change in the whole concentration as we move from the left side of the crystal to the right. So what happens when we have a change in carrier concentrations? So there is a gradient. When gradients, concentration gradients exist, we get one of two types of carrier transport, right? There was the only two that we talked about last time, which is the correct one. Is it drift or is it diffusion? Diffusion, okay? So we should observe that electrons are going to diffuse from left to right. which means we get a diffusion current. Uh, since the electrons are moving from left to right, our current is from right to left. And we have hole diffusion. The holes are diffusing Sorry, electrons are diffusing from right to left, right? Because there's more electrons on the right-hand side of the crystal than there are on the left-hand side, which means our diffusion current density should be from left to right. Holes are diffusing from left to right. which means that if our holes are diffusing from left to right, holes being the blue line, then we get a current from left to right as well, okay? So what's happening is that these holes are traveling this way and some electrons are traveling this way. What's gonna happen when those diffusing electrons and holes meet each other near the junction? So if I have a hole, or excuse me, if I have an electron and a lack of an electron, what's gonna happen? Or the hole is a space in the conduction band where an electron wants to go effectively. We're gonna get recombination, okay? So we're going to see that our charge, excuse me, our charge carriers close to our junction are going to recombine. And what that's going to do is it's going to leave behind ionized donor and acceptor atoms with no associated free charge carrier. So this is, let's call this at E is equal to zero. And then a short time afterwards, I'm not going to bother redrawing all of those. Um, ions and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to have a neutral E region over here, a neutral N region over here, <coughs> excuse me, and then let's see, blue.
I'm going to have ionized acceptor atoms. And ionized donor atoms. And I'm making a distinct point here to make sure that the exact same amount of charge on the left hand junction is reflected on the right hand side of the junction. I'm going to call this guy here WP here's zero and here's WN. So from zero to WN is the width of what we're going to call the depletion region on the end side of the junction. It's also called the space charge layer because there's stored charge here. And from zero to, let's call it negative WP, is the width of the P side of the space charge layer or the depletion region. This total width, I'm going to call W naught, which is the width of the depletion region. So I want to be clear here. Depletion region or space charge layer, WN, width of N side, WP is the width of the P side. All right. So let me ask you guys a question that you may technically not know the answer to. That'll be okay. What happens when I have stored, stored a charge that is separated? Anybody have any idea? Two correct answers here. You have a capacitance. That is absolutely correct, and that's something that we're going to talk about towards the end of this bit. Um, the other thing that we have is an electric field. Okay, Whenever you have positive charge separated from negative charge, like you have in a capacitor, right? if there's positive charge on the top plate and there's negative charge stored on the bottom plate, then an electric field exists between those plates. That is exactly what we have here. So we are going to have an electric field oriented from the positive charge to the negative charge like so. What is that electric field going to do? What type of carrier transport is associated with electric field strength? Drift, okay. So what's going to happen <clears throat> so we have, let me draw another diagram uh, for co concentrations here real quick. All right, so Just for the sake of argument, that's the wrong color. I need to put my bounds of my depletion region here so I don't draw this incorrectly. So the blue line is my pole concentration, red line is my electron concentration. Our space charge layer or our depletion 
region is effectively devoid of charge carriers, right? Anything that got there recombined with the opposite type of charge carrier. So we still have some concentration gradient, meaning we should still see that holes are trying to diffuse to the right and electrons are trying to diffuse to the left. But now that bound charge in the space charge layer is effectively saying, well, I'm gonna make it really hard for holes uh, to travel this way, right? Because the electric field is pointing in the opposite direction. And I'm gonna make it really hard for electrons to travel from right to left because the E field is from right to left. So what we will see is that effectively that space charge layer and its associated electric field is going to grow as recombination occurs until such a point as the whole drift current and the whole diffusion current on the left-hand side of the crystal cancel each other out and the electron drift current and the electron diffusion current on the right-hand side of the crystal exactly cancel each other out so that there's no more net current flow in the device because we are not putting any electrical bias on here to cause current to flow. So it would make sense that there's no current flowing, right? So this is what a, how a PN junction after it's formed behaves. So I want to be clear here on the left-hand side, we're gonna have J diffusion P plus J drift P is equal to zero. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna have J diffusion N plus J drift N is equal to zero. So those two currents completely cancel each other out, okay? And it's because of that applied field that is created by those two bound charges increasing as recombination occurs near the junction. So the charge accumulation in the depletion region results in the formation of what we're gonna call a barrier or built-in potential, okay? So our barrier potential built, I think your textbook calls it the built-in voltage. So let's use that nomenclature, okay? So uh, charge accumulation in the depletion region. results in the formation of a barrier potential v naught is equal to vn minus vp so this is vn is just the height of the barrier potential on the n side of the junction vp is the height of the barrier potential on the p side of the junction Nothing fancy there. Um, so did you guys talk about when, when you did your baby quantum physics in 334, um, prob, uh, probabilities of where electrons are um, like in a potential well, that kind of stuff. So this is, this is effectively that situation. There's a, there's a big voltage in the middle which means that it's really hard for electrons to get across one way or the other. That's all that's happening here, okay? The built-in voltage or built-in potential V naught maintains equilibrium within the PN junction.
by reducing carrier and let me be clear, majority tra carrier transport to zero. What I mean by majority carrier transport is it's governing the diffusion and drift of holes on the P side and electrons on the N side. So just to be clear, J diffusion P plus J drift P is equal to zero. And J diffusion N plus J drift N is equal to zero. So one thing that we're going to want to know is what the value of that potential barrier is, because that's gonna give us a measure of how hard it will be or how much we need to bias this guy in order to induce a current. I, 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 when I say induce here, I do not mean explicitly using Faraday's law of induction. I mean, trying to get current to flow. So, so I know you guys are taking, well, now you've, you've taken physics 202 and you're taking an E&M class. So I have to be very careful about the words I choose here because they're gonna mean slightly different things in slightly different places. So if we look at the equilibrium equation for holes, right? Um, so this guy over here on the left, we would have Q mu P E, e so excuse me minus Q D P by DX is equal to zero. I'm literally just substituting in our relationships explicitly for holes into this equation. Okay. So on the left hand, the, the first term is our drift equation for holes. And the second hand term is our diffusion equation for holes. If we rearrange this guy, meaning we can notice that there's a common factor of Q on both sides, so we can throw that away. Um, I'm effectively just trying to isolate the variable EX. So rearranging, I get EX is equal to DP divided by mu P. one over px, our whole concentration, multiplied by dp by dx, like so. Um, from physics 202, I can get the voltage from the electric field by taking the derivative. So the electric field is voltage with respect to position negative. Now I have dp mu p one over px dp dx. I can use the Einstein relationship that we talked about at the end of last class to convert dp over mu p into kbt over q, our thermal voltage. And I'm gonna multiply both sides by dx and integrate. And so what that's going to give me is the integral from Vp to Vn of d dx will be equal to negative kBt over Q. That's just a constant. The integral from the whole concentration on the P side of the crystal to the whole concentration on the N side of the crystal, one over P 
dp. And this gives me v naught is equal to kbt over q times the natural log of pp naught over pn naught. And if I substitute in my values that we talked about at the beginning, finally, this gives me kbt over q natural log of Na times Nd over Ni squared. This is our equation for the height of our barrier potential. Okay. Um, and with this simple equation, you can now do the last two homework problems for homework set one. Um, so before we move along to uh, related topics, anybody have any questions about any of this? Cameron, what's up? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, so on the voltage integral, I'm integrating from VP to VN. And on the distribution integral, I'm integrating from PP naught, the whole concentration on the P side of the crystal, to PN naught, the whole concentration on the N side of the crystal. Any other questions before we move along here? All right. So, N A in the last equation that I boxed, N A multiplied by N D divided by N I squared, where N A is P P naught and Ni squared over Nd is Pn naught, which is exactly what I had drawn on our initial carrier concentration thing. So I'm not, not doing any magic or pulling a fast one on you guys at all. We've introduced where literally all of this comes from. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. The negative sign here, uh, let me, here, here, and here comes from the fact that V is equal to the negative integral of E DL. And so when I do the anti-integral of that, I guess effectively, uh, that's where that negative sign is coming from. So that's a uh, ELEM 313 slash physics 202 relationship. So. Didn't magic it up, it's supposed to be there. Any other questions? All right. Let us talk now briefly about charge distribution. So we've talked about a couple of minutes ago, the lack of free charge carriers in the depletion region results in an accumulation of charge due to a layer of negative ions on the P side 
and a layer of positive ions on the N side of the junction. Just restating what we talked about a while ago. Um, because the junction is at equilibrium, the net charge over the entire crystal must be zero, meaning that there's as much positive charge stored on the N side. All right, sorry, Zoom crapped out for a second and I needed to let it start recording again. So what I was saying is there's an equal amount of charge stored on either side of the junction. So if we look at the volume charge density of this guy as a function of space within the crystal, this is our junction at zero. Here's X rho volume as a function of X where rho is our charge density per unit area. We should see that on the N side, we have, let's see, I was using red. And on the P side, actually, let me. And on the P side, add something like this. That guy should be negative. Where this bit right here is negative Q and A, and this bit right here is positive Q and D. This width is WN, this width is minus WP. And so we can describe our charge density as combination of step functions. Negative Q and A for negative WP less than X less than zero. Positive Q and D for zero less than X less than WN, zero everywhere else. Okay, so this is what our charge distribution looks like. Um, and it's the reason why, so uh, I've made it a point to draw the fact that uh, the size of the junction on the inside is smaller than the size of the junction on the P side. Let me, let me circle back around to the first page to show you guys that. All right. So the inside WN has a smaller width than that of WP, but the same amount of charge is stored. And the reason why I chose to draw it that way is because the whole side is less heavily doped, or excuse me, the, the P side is less heavily doped than the N side. So whichever side is doped more should have a smaller depletion region width because there's more ions packed in there. And so it doesn't take as much space to uncover the same amount of charge. I just wanted to be clear about how I was drawing it and the reason for it, not just, you know, losing my mental faculties. All right, so since the charge on each side must be equal,
we get an A times WP. Let's put knots here to make sure that we're talking about thermal equilibrium is equal to ND times WN not. Now, without doing a whole bunch of derivation here, because it's going to be applying uh, Gauss's law and some of the stuff like that from 313 that you guys may not have had yet, I can define WN naught, the width of the N side of the depletion region, will be twice epsilon over Q, where epsilon is the permittivity of silicon times Na divided by Nd multiplied by one over Na plus Nd times our barrier potential and W P naught is twice epsilon over Q Nd divided by Na, one over Na plus Nd times V naught. And finally, W naught is simply Wn naught plus Wp naught, which comes out to be the square root of two epsilon over Q and a plus nd divided by and a times nd times v naught. Let me erase that because it looks shitty. So these are the widths of uh, the n side of the depletion region, the p side of the depletion region, and the total width of the depletion region. I don't think this part is actually covered in your textbook, but I think it's useful for you to know. And it's gonna make understanding what's going on when we talk about our next topic significantly easier because we have mathematical quantities to look back at. All right, so does anybody have any questions regarding uh, charge distribution and the size of the junction? So the size of the junction is, purport, uh, is related to both uh, the doping concentrations and the size of the built-in potential. So that sounds to me like a good theory question to put on your test. Hint, hint, hint. Uh, anybody got anything for me before we move ahead to depletion layer capacitance? All right. So in an unbiased PN junction, there are net positive and net negative charges separated over a distance omega naught. Um, if we change the voltage present across the junction,
the depletion region width will change. And this is what we're gonna spend the next, uh, the rest of the week talking about. Depletion region width changes. And thus the charge accumulated in the depletion region changes as well. Since capacitance is defined as C capacitance is equal to the change in charge. Sorry, I'm so used to writing thetas, I don't even remember how to write a Q anymore. With respect to the change in voltage, we would expect the depletion region. of a PN junction to behave like a capacitor. So if we look at our system, and let's pop back to the first page to do just that. We have some negative charge stored on this side of the junction and a fixed boundary. And we have some positive charge stored on the right hand or the end side of the junction and a fixed boundary. So this guy is actually a pretty good example of a parallel plate capacitor, assuming that our crystal is uh, rectangular in cross section. Um, so, we can use that and the definition uh, for the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. C is equal to epsilon A, our cross-sectional area, divided by D. Well, in this case, we're going to call this C J naught, J for junction, not for at thermal equilibrium is just epsilon A divided by W naught, the total width of our junction, because that is the distance separating our two plates. And from this, finally, we'll have epsilon A multiplied by the square root of Q divided by two epsilon V naught N A times N D over N A plus N D. And we'll revisit this concept um, later when we get more firmly into bi uh, biasing. So we can see that as the bias voltage changes, the width of the depletion region changes, which then causes the width of the junction capacitance uh, to change as well. But I just wanted to introduce that topic. All right. Any questions on the very basics of depletion layer or junction capacitance? Hopefully fairly straightforward. It's just a parallel plate capacitor. All right. <clears throat> so, Let's now introduce some of these biasing effects. Okay. So let's talk about first the forward biased PN junction. All right. 
So let's say that I have a junction. Metallurgical junction as before. And we're starting off with it at equilibrium. So I have a neutral P region on the left, a neutral N region on the right. I have positive charge stored over here and dang it, negative charge stored over here. And I am going to apply a voltage, okay? So I slap some leads on this guy I connect the positive terminal of my voltage to the P region and the negative terminal of my voltage source to the N region. What do you guys think is going to happen? So let's consider this voltage VF is a battery, okay? A DC voltage source. So the negative polarity side can be thought of as supplying electrons to this side, right? So I have a large concentration of electrons from the negative terminal of my battery seeing a large number of electrons on the inside of my crystal. Are they going to repel each other? Or are they going to attract each other? They're going to repel, right? So I'm going to see that the electrons being supplied by my voltage source repel the electrons in my neutral end region, which means they're going to drive those free electrons towards the space charge layer, right? So I should see that the width of my space charge layer is going to decrease, right? Because if I force electrons over here, the charge distribution on, the, on this side of the junction needs to stay the same as this side of the junction. So the extra electrons here are going to attract extra electrons, or excuse me, extra holes from this side. And overall, the width of the depletion region is going to get smaller. Okay, um, what does that mean for our barrier potential? Is it gonna be increased or reduced? It'll be smaller, right. So the effects of forward biasing are Electrons on the N side are driven towards the space charge layer, attracting holes from the P side. This causes the width of the depletion region to decrease as, now I'm just going to do W, it's not at 
equilibrium anymore, so there's no zero. The square root of twice epsilon over Q N A plus N D over N A times N D times V mot not, excuse me, minus V F. So our forward bias voltage causes the width of the depletion region to decrease. And our new barrier potential is just that quantity V naught minus VF. Um, since the width of the depletion region is smaller, Uh, let's see, since the width of the depletion region is smaller, the charge stored in the depletion region is also smaller leading to a lower barrier potential. This reduction in barrier potential means majority carriers can more easily diffuse across the depletion region. And that will yield so if the holes can diffuse from left to right and the electrons can diffuse from right to left, that's going to give us a net current flowing from the P side of the junction to the N side of the junction. So I'm going to draw a graph. So our space charge layer has been reduced. So our field here is going to be E naught minus E. We're going to have So there's this little region right here that is excess holes. And if I draw it from the opposite side, sorry, I need to draw my horizontal axis zero, negative WP, positive WN. 
Um, if I look at my electron concentration. Look something like this. Here are excess electrons. So this is still on the edges of the crystal, NP naught and N naught, NP naught, P naught, and just to make it super clear. I am indeed applying my bias voltage like so. Okay. So from the graph that I have just drawn, we can see that there are a slight increase in the majority carrier concentrations uh, and this is due to the battery supplying carriers which are attracted to the bound charge layers in the depletion region. So what I'm talking about specifically there is like this little bump and this little bump. So the charges here are drawn, uh, excess charges are drawn to the bound space charge layer. Then we have our excess minority carrier concentrations close to the boundaries of the space charge layer as well. And this is because of a process called minority carrier injection. And minority carrier injection is the mechanism that causes current to flow under forward bias, okay? So, The excess minority carrier concentrations are due to a process called minority carrier injection. Um, the reduction in barrier, <coughs> excuse me, potential relates to an exponential increase in the probability of diffusion for majority carriers. across the space charge layer yeah all right um let's see we have 10 minutes left and a good amount of math so let's save the math for the beginning of next class um so let me let's take a look work real quick. <clears throat> so looking at homework one, problem three, simply calculating the built-in potential for a set of parameters. And then part B asks what the change in the built in potential will be if we increase, <coughs> excuse me, the acceptor concentration 
by one order of magnitude, meaning we multiplied it by 10. So if we increase Na from 2.6 times 10 to the 16 to 2.6 times 10 to the 17, what happens? Well, you're going to increase the barrier potential, I think, by about 60 millivolts or something like that. So that one's pretty easy. Next problem. Um, problem four. A silicon PN junction with 1.4 times 10 to the 16 donors per cubic centimeter is at thermodynamic equilibrium at T is equal to 276 Kelvin due to a mask misalignment during the microfabrication process. The P side was not doped. Determine the built in potential of the diode. So we have a PN junction where one side, it's not, I guess it's not even technically a PN junction, it's a P intrinsic junction, right? Uh, donor atoms, or sorry, it's a intrinsic N junction because it's donor atoms. So what are we gonna use? Uh, the built-in potential is KBT over Q. So KB is a constant, Q is a constant, T is given here at 276 Kelvin, multiplied by the natural log of Na times Nd over Ni squared. Well, Nd is given to us, but Na is zero. Does that mean the barrier potential is zero? No, right. So instead of saying Na is zero, that's just the whole concentration, right? So the whole concentration is gonna be the intrinsic carrier concentration on that side of the crystal. So we would just have KBT over Q multiplied by the natural log of ND over NI, and that's gonna give us our barrier potential for this jacked up crystal. Okay, so nothing, nothing wild or crazy there. Uh, let's look at homework set two, because that says it's gonna open uh, today at 9.15. See if there's anything that we can do. A PN junction with applied reverse bias. So nope, we haven't got there yet. This is a circuit with diodes in it, not there. All right, so finish up homework one. It looks like that's as far as we can go for right now. And then uh, we'll finish up forward bias PN junctions and reverse bias PN junctions on Wednesday. And that should allow us to start working on the homework set again. All right, you guys have a great rest of your day. Oh, uh, one thing, um, I am changing my office hours uh, so they, they they were starting at 1230 and uh, I'm changing them to where they start at 130 p.m. Uh, the reason for that is so that I can drive all the way back home to Minden and work on uploading you guys' videos because my desktop in my office is crappy and old and it takes forever and my PC at home is nice and new and so it does it much more quickly. So it will actually save me a considerable amount of time and, and let me get the videos up for you guys much more quickly if I go home. So my office hours now will be 1.30 to 5, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, via Zoom. And the link is on the course webpage. All right. Um, please return the uh, sign-up sheet, please.